Mike Radich here, and I'm now joining the phone by Tachi Palace Fights welterweight champion Nate Logren. Nate, how are you? I'm doing excellent. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Nate, you got a fight coming up August 7th at Tachi Palace Fights 20. I'm very interested in this fight because you were supposed to have a fight with Eric Silva back in in February of this year. You were supposed to fight him at UFC Fight Night 36 in Brazil. The fight didn't take place. Uh, You pulled out of the fight. A lot of people said that the reason for pulling out of the fight was personal reasons. Some people said it was injuries on why that fight against Silva didn't take place. What's the real story? I'm very curious. What actually happened? Why didn't you fight Eric Silva back in February? Well, um, after my last fight, I, um, I hurt my sternum. Right. And uh, the UFC asked me to fight, and I really, I thought it would be about 10, maybe 12 days, and uh, I would be back full training, and that would give me uh, like two weeks to train for Eric, which as far as endurance was concerned, it would be uh, more than enough time because I just saw a five-round fight. Mm Mm-hmm. But uh, it turned out that it took a lot longer. It took me about 12 weeks to heal my sternum because I um, I kept re-injuring it in practice. And then uh, I just assumed I would be better, so I said yes because it was such a great opportunity. But I, I, I didn't even get to train one day. I wouldn't have trained one day if I took the fight when I was supposed to. So my coach and manager and me decided it wasn't a good time. This is a very interesting situation because you signed on for a fight against Eric Silva, then you couldn't fight that fight, and then rather than the UFC telling you, hey, heal up, and then we'll get you another fight, they don't get you another fight, and you're back out on the regional circuit. So I'm very curious, how did that all come together? How did it go from you're getting ready to fight Eric Silva, you can't fight because of an injury, to you're back out on the regional circuit. How did that become a option for you? How, how come they just couldn't get you another fight at a later date? Keep you on the roster, but... I don't remember physically signing any papers mm-hmm. for the UFC, so it's, uh, I just said it verbally, and then I uh, usually I say it verbally, and a couple weeks later I'm signing something. And... Uh, I never physically signed anything, so I, I technically, I guess I didn't sign with the UFC, mm. and that's a, that. I maybe that's why I didn't get to uh, stay in that organization, and I'm back on the regional circuit. Mm. It's interesting that you say that you never signed anything because I knew there had to be a good reason of why you're not in the UFC anymore. And now we find out that you were never signed there. So it makes a lot more sense now because I was very confused because one minute you're getting ready to fight Eric Silva and then the next minute you're not in the UFC. And then we fast forward five or six months and then you're getting ready to fight back at Tachi Palace against uh, Ricky Legier. So I was very curious about this whole situation, but I'm still a little bit confused and, and Maybe you can clear it up for me. What about the title at Tachi Palace? Is this a title defense against Ricky Legier on August 7th? Are you defending the welterweight belt, or is this a vacant title? Yes, I know you fought against Keto Andrews last time, and you claimed the TPF welterweight title, but is this a vacant title fight? Because obviously a lot of people thought that you were re-signing with the UFC, and usually when that happens, the champ at TPF vacates the title so i'm just curious is this a title defense or are you fighting for a vacant belt on august 7th uh, yeah as far as i um, know it's a title defense it should be a five rounder mm-hmm. so uh and this is actually the first time i've ever defended a title but uh, yeah as far as i know it's a five rounder mm-hmm. honestly i'm the kind of fighter you know they just point i go right i trust my coach and my manager a lot i've been with them for over a decade and i know they I, I just trust them. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and I'm down to fight anyone. So, mm-hmm. when they point them out, I just go as long as my sternum's not early. <laughs> right, right, right. I see. I see. So uh, I don't. I don't get too involved with. I don't ask any questions. I don't. Um, I'm not a big social media guy. I'm not. Um, I just honestly, I just like to fight and uh, all the paperwork and stuff. I think my manager for leaving me out of the loop and a lot of that honestly so it seems like I don't know what's going on (laughs) but uh, it's kind of the way I like it to an extent I just 
just tell me how I'm going to fight. I'm going to watch his video a couple times. I'm going to study about him. And, uh, and I'll just fight him. Mm-hmm. Has that been the way your career has always worked? Have you always been, okay, you know, let me handle the fighting, and then my manager and my coaches, you guys handle the business end, or is this a, a recent development? Yeah. Um, yeah, my manager, he's really good about that. Um, Tom Call, he's really... I, you know, I really asked him, like, I don't like, I'm not big on paperwork, I'm not, yeah, I'm not here to do any of that, I'm just here to fight, and, uh, I just, I just like to fight, you know, <laughs> and, uh, he, he deals with all that stuff I don't like. I used to really not like interviews, but now I don't mind them so much. Mm-hmm. I see, I see. I'm just curious, between the PFC middleweight belt and the Tachi Palace Fights welterweight belt, what belt means more to you? What belt is more near and dear to your heart? Do you have a favorite between those two? I I kind of associate them together. Um, uh, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, the first one, I guess I got. I gotta go with the first one. The um, the one I earned first. Mm-hmm. The Palace Fighting Championship belt, mm-hmm. but. Uh, it's cool that I finally get to defend a belt. Mm-hmm. It feels like instead of we're just trying to take something that's there, he's trying to take something that's mine. Mm-hmm. And it uh, definitely gives you a little different perspective on the whole belt situation. Mm-hmm. So I'm really looking forward to actually defending the belt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I can definitely understand why that would be a hard question to answer because the PFC belt when you fought for them and became middleweight champion, that was the fight that kind of catapulted you into the UFC. That's the fight that got people buzzing, and that's what really got you on the UFC radar. And then, obviously, the Tachi Palace welterweight belt, that's a big deal because you you had that long layoff from the sport, and now you're rebuilding yourself to try to get another run in the UFC. So I, I can see where it's a very tough question to answer because the belts, you know, either or, whatever one that you choose, it has has a great meaning in your career. So I, I, I'm, I was very curious about that. So anyways, last time out, November 14th, Tachi Palace Fight 17, you claimed the Walter White title against Keto Andrews, a five-round unanimous decision. A lot of people thought going into that fight because they questioned Keto Andrews' ground game. They, they thought that it was a, a very tough matchup for him, and they thought that if you were able able to get your hands on him that you wouldn't have any trouble submitting him. That ended up not happening. I mean, it was a very dominant win for you, but you didn't get that submission. So I'm just curious, overall, are you pleased with your performance against Keto Andrews back in November? Um, honestly, um, initially, I was uh, I was not happy at all. I spoke with my coach and my manager, and they were bringing up a couple points I never really thought about. Like, uh, it was the first time I fought at 70, and I was cutting a good, you know, 15, 16 pounds. And uh, and then I, it was the first time I ever had a five-round fight, too. Mm-hmm. So it, that's, you know, that's a step in the right direction. Another thing that a lot of people don't know is, um, Keto, one of Keto's kickboxing coaches was our kickboxing coach for like six years. So he kind of knew a lot of my game. And not only that, he knew uh, a lot of my, you know, people have permanent injuries where their uh, their body's not 100%. And he knew where a couple of mine were. And he had his, uh, his fighter go for that, you know. So there was a couple psychological things I overcame that made, uh, that made it, my performance not seem as bad in my mind after they explained that to me because I didn't really think of it in that context. But um, uh, it's uh, honestly, I felt the exact same way I should have finished them. But I honestly think that the weight cut and then the five round thing made me be a lot more cautious with my energy. And uh, as a result, um, I was honestly kind of scared I would burn out if I went for a submission too hard. So I didn't really go for one too hard. And as a result, I ended up with a decision, which uh, I don't like. <laughs> Definitely right. don't like. Right. And 
I definitely feel I should have finished him. I had a lot of really good positions on him, and I didn't finish him. So, but I, uh, my endurance is a lot better. I have confidence in my endurance more now, and I feel comfortable at seventies as well. So, I don't um, see that being a problem in the future. In that keto Andrews fight, did your arms burn out? They did. My forearms. Uh, I torched my forearms out big time, and. Uh, when I went for like three or four chokes, mm-hmm. and uh, I've been working my forearms a lot. <laughs> right. This one, and honestly, um, another factor is my school is really, really good at jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. And honestly, like I feel like no one can rear naked and choke me. Like I, I have I have a black belt on my back for an hour, and they can't rear naked and choke me. And honestly, uh, there's blue belts and like a couple white belts at my gym that I can't even tap with the rear naked choke. So I tend not to even bother to go for it. And I think as a result, um, my technique wasn't as good and my, uh, in my muscular endurance on my forearms wasn't up to par as it should have been because I really never go for that move. And, uh, and I think the cut had a factor too. I was leaking pretty good all over the place. And, uh, but I knew the ref wasn't going to stop it because he already checked it. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't really too worried he was going to stop it. But at one point in the third round, uh, I, there was a, about 45 seconds where I was basically blind. I couldn't see at all. And uh, I just closed that eye until the blood wicked out. And then it came back. It was just blurred. I, I could see blurs at least. And then I closed it for a couple more seconds. And then I could see. So I think um, the blood had a little factor in that as well, mm-hmm. in me uh, not necessarily going for it. Because if I missed the the armbar, which I usually do from the back, then he would be on top. And uh, when I had his back and he was on top of me is when the blood leaked into my eye. So I didn't want to be on the bottom and have it leaking into my eye when he was attention to ground and pound me so I think I was a little cautious going for the armbar that I would have went for had I not been bleeding as well mm-hmm. so there's all these little tiny factors that contributed mm-hmm. to all that mm-hmm. where exactly was that cut was that on the bridge of the nose or was it where the like the eye socket meets the nose where exactly was that cut if you went uh, if you took a ruler and went yeah it was right on the bridge of the nose under the eye okay Okay. And it started at the end of the second, so I bled pretty much like a stuffed pig for three rounds. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, Keto Andrews and you went to the same high school. I don't know if you guys were the same grade or anything, but you guys did go to the same high school. So I'm just curious, were there bragging yeah. rights on the line in this fight? Um, he was a real humble guy. He was like the um, he was a super stud athlete, and he played all the popular sports. Like he was a a stud football captain. He was a, uh, really good at track and field, and he was really good at basketball. And uh, I was a defensive soccer player and a wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, did cross country track, and uh, so yeah. Um, and he was a really humble guy. Like a lot of the guys who were as good athletes as him were just assholes, you know, and he was just a really nice guy. He was really nice to all the um, younger guys. So I, I kind of looked up to him in a way. And uh, But I, I had that little feeling like, there can't be someone from my school who could beat me up. Right, like, right. I didn't even feel like there's someone from my city, let alone my school. So I was uh, almost surprised to hear that. Right. I didn't even know he fought for, I saw his eighth fight, I think. I was at a card where my teammate was, and I saw his eighth fight, and I was, I was surprised he was a fighter because he's such a nice guy. And uh, but yeah, I definitely think not, um, there was a little. I wanted to be the tough guy for my school factor in that for sure. Mm. I see, I see. So the cross country guy beat up the star football player. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> we uh, the soccer team. They used to get the whole soccer team to go out to the cross country meets, and we would just for our warm up we would do the, the cross country meets, all the home ones. Oh, and uh, we really, we really helped the team. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of endurance guys. So, but 
yeah, it's it pretty funny like that. <laughs> oh, I see, I see. Now, coming up on August 7th, you're going to be taking on Ricky Legere Jr. What are your thoughts about him as an opponent? I love him as an opponent. Like, uh, one of the main things that changed, um, when they changed from Ricky to Keto, I went from a guy who wants to chase after you and fight you to a guy who's more evasive and will, uh, more evade the fight, wouldn't mind winning by points. And, uh, my preferred matchup is Ricky Legere. Like, a guy will meet me dead in the middle and he'll try to kill me. Like, not necessarily a guy who's going to try and point it out and just win. Mm -hmm. So I really, really like the Ricky matchup. He comes to win, he comes to kill. And, uh, I really like that about him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much film have you studied on Legere? I. I tend to not go too far back in their career okay. because you know how much you improve mm -hmm. and you're going to be looking at mistakes they don't make anymore. And uh, one of the things I look for instead of like what they're lacking is I'll look for what's ingrained in them. Like if I throw a jab, he shoots a double late. Like, and I'll look to take advantage of those things that are absolutely ingrained in them that they, they would have to think not to do. And I'm looking more for that than looking for shortcomings in their game but the, the main shortcoming I see in his game is uh, he's not too good at energy conservation he'll tend to just go uh, just go blow his load really um, and uh, he just comes out really hard with his wrestling and uh, the people who beat him either just stand up right as they get took down or uh They'll just endure until he gets tired, and then they'll win uh, the endurance. And uh, I, my cardio is the best it's ever been. I'm actually at the track right now to get ready to run. I've been coming a couple times a week, and I run six times a week. And I just feel like uh, my cardio will win the day. Is this I don't feel like he could take me out, and I feel uh, that... I'll eventually just have a lot more energy than him in there and be able to finish him. Is this your second fight down at 170, or is this the third time? Because you fought Jamie Hara, who usually fights at either 170 or, or middleweight. Uh, so is this the second time or the third time down at welterweight? This is the second. Technically, we um, Jara wouldn't go down to 70 if he wanted to do 75. Okay. And uh, ironically, Jara's the biggest guy I've ever fought. <laughs> <laughs> and it was supposedly... Because I fought all those other fights at middleweight, and then I'm fighting one at 175, and uh, and then I saw what he weighed in before we fought, because they come and weigh you. He was 203. <laughs> I'm like, dang. It is, uh, it is by far the biggest guy I ever fought. I thought that was kind of funny. But uh, yeah, this is the second one at welterweight, officially. Mm, I see, I see. Where do you see this fight taking place? Do you see this fight being a fight where it takes place on the ground? Do you see this fight being a, a true mixed martial arts fight where we can see a little bit of everything? Or do you see this fight being one of those situations where you guys are two good grapplers and usually we see two good grapplers cancel each other out and it's all stand-up? Where do you see the fight taking place between those three options? Do you see this fight being, being a true mixed martial arts fight or do you think we could see one area of the game take over and that's what we're treated to on August 7th? What do you think? Um, it since it's going to be five rounds, I definitely see it going anywhere. Um, if a guy, because um, I'm a pretty good wrestler, but I just don't use it because mm -hmm. I want to use my jiu-jitsu and I like my jiu-jitsu from my back a better. So uh, a lot of times in my first couple of fights, I would let the guy take me down in the beginning because he's dry mm -hmm. and they're a lot easier to submit. But um, if they're wet, by the time I get took down, I usually just stand up. And uh, I I plan on trying to tire him out. So uh, if, uh, if he happens to get a takedown on me, I'm just going to stand up. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I noticed Bobby Green when he fought Ricky Legere. Every time he got took down, he instantly just stood up, turned around. And then they say the ratio for takedown offense to takedown defense is about three to one energy. So if you're doing the takedown, you're using about three times as much energy. So uh, I invite him to come try and take me down. And uh, the thing I had 
the thing that I did best in wrestling was take down defense. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm 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 confident in my wrestling, even against Ricky. I know he did a little D one wrestling and stuff, but uh, I'm I'm really confident in it. Mm-hmm. But I see I see uh, a little bit of everything. I know what you mean. Two grapplers tend to slug it out. Right. <laughs> I don't know. That happens a lot. It's weird. It is a weird phenomenon in MMA. I see a little of it, but a little of everything, though. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to touch on it a little bit. Your hiatus from the sport. You fought Tim Crater in the UFC in December of 2008, and mm-hmm. you took a very long time off. You finally made your return back in May of 2012 when you fought Jamie Hara. Um, that gap, what exactly went on during that time? Obviously, you, you were in the UFC. You, you suffered that injury in the Crater fight. And then you actually asked the UFC for a release because it was taking you a long time to heal up from injuries that you had uh, during the time you know, off of, of not fighting. So what exactly went on during that time and why the long gap? I, uh, I, I dislocated two ribs, separated my cartilage and that's the tendon in my abdomen on that fight. And, uh, I went back in, I mean, I don't know if you've ever dislocated ribs or separated cartilage, but it's not, it's not too quick to heal. And uh, I kept coming, I came back into practice twice. I got kicked there once. And that was like three months after. Um, and I reheard it. Um, and then I heard it again like two months later. I broke my hand. I broke my foot. I got a staff infection. I separated my shoulder. I uh, uh, torn labrum in the same shoulder. <laughs> like, I got just injury after injury after injury and uh it was extremely frustrating and it was de- it definitely tested my my will to want to fight and uh, uh i eventually healed and uh part of the factor was i learned how to heal you know i learned how to take care of myself and i just grew a lot as a person and one of the other main factors was uh i had a boss he said something to me, and it just really rang true, and it was like, he said uh, he knows me as a person, and he knows that by the time it's, you know, my life's over and it's all said and done, the thing that I'm best at on this planet, you know, I don't want it to be hurting another person. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just felt like I had to learn, like, the thing I was best at on this planet was hurting people, and I, it just didn't sit well with me, like... That's the point of my life to learn how to hurt people. So I, I felt like uh, I embraced a lot of other aspects of my life, and uh, and I started looking, you know, because fighting doesn't last forever. And I started to looking to what I'm going to do after fighting, and I really got into that, which is uh, growing plants. I, I'm just really into growing any kind of plant, and I grow over half the food I eat at a community garden in Runner Park where I live, and uh, I just started really embracing, not just fighting, like, and uh, it's funny how how putting emphasis on all those other things has helped my fighting. It's, it's crazy. It's, uh, it was kind of an unexpected uh, bonus almost. Right. It's, uh, I think, you know, the injuries and that realization made me think, man, I gotta do do something besides this, you know, because if you look at boxing, you know, 90 of the, 90% of those guys are broken destitute when it's all said and done, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I'm definitely not going to be one of those people as a result of uh, MMA. Right, right. Now, how were you suffering all these injuries? Was it just, well, you, you get an injury and then you try not to to re-aggravate that one, and then that would lead to another injury? Like, like, how do you keep getting all these injuries? Because you just named off, like, an injury from every part of the body. How, how were you able to get all these? Well, that was in three years, mind you. Right. And, right. Uh, you know, because I was out for three years. Right. But one thing sister did her master's thesis on at UNC was that if you don't have an even core, even core strength, like maybe your stomach's too mm-hmm. strong, your back weak, and uh, the correlation between not having core strength and injuries 
and after I hurt my ribs, I didn't um I didn't work out any any core exercises for for months and months, and I noticed the correlation between having even strong core, which I have now, and how often you get injured, which I rarely get injured now. So I just I think that. Uh, was definitely a contributing factor in me getting hurt, and then the psychological aspect. I was, I was, um, I always had a soccer coach. He always told me, "You go in half ass, you get hurt." Mm-hmm. Right. I think uh, in practice, I was going in half ass. Um, I was a little scared to get hurt, and I think that led me to getting hurt more. And then once I overcame that, I. Uh, just been a thing of the past once I got it out of my head and I haven't got hurt too much. Uh, this is the least hurt I've ever been for camp and then the last fight was the second least hurt I've ever been for camp so I think that comes with maturity and age and learning to take care of myself and just learning how to breathe and meditate and just every, you know, the whole shebang, like all that stuff contributes to me not getting hurt as much anymore. Mm-hmm. How close were you to hanging up the gloves and retiring from the sport? Were you very close? I mean, obviously you had all these injuries and you were away from the sport for a long time. You had multiple things working against you because not only were you not healthy, the other thing was the sport moves so quickly. So many things change. The game evolves all the time. So when you're on the sidelines and not being a part of it, you don't really evolve with it. I mean, yes, you can improve in the gym and stuff like that, but the real measuring stick is when you get in the cage and fight. So you had multiple things working against you. So I'm just curious, how close were you to retiring from mixed martial arts? The closest I ever was was the second time I, or the third time I hurt my ribs, the second time after um, I initially heard it, um, I heard it, I knew that I got kicked perfectly right there by a really high level kickboxer. And uh, I just went in my car and I was hurting and I was, I was almost in tears just speeding. I don't speed either, I drive like a grandma. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I just, I was going like 80 miles an hour down the freeway. I was just like, just trying to hold back the tears, like, just tears of frustration. And, uh, you know, I got a lot, um, I read a lot, and, uh, and I got a lot of good friends and family just gave me a lot of good advice. And, uh, one of the ones I heard is, uh, tears of anger worth more than diamonds and rubies. And, uh, just that, just keep that energy, that frustration, and, and just put it in a positive direction. And yeah, I just, I'd never, I never fathomed. It didn't quite come to my head like I'm going to quit, but that was definitely the absolute closest mm-hmm. and most frustrated I've ever been. Mm-hmm. For sure. Now, have you ever sat back and thought about what your life would look like had you not got injured, had you stayed in the UFC, had you let the fights play out in the cage? Obviously, the last time against Crater, you suffered an injury, so it didn't really get settled with actual fighting. It got settled with an injury. So did you ever sit back and think, if I didn't get injured, this would happen to me? Was there ever a time where you where you dwelled on that? Was there ever a time where, or maybe you're over it now, but was there ever a time where you sat back and thought, okay, my life would look like this if I didn't get injured? Was there ever a time that you thought something about what could have been? I think that's a really good question. And uh, I think one of my strengths as a fighter is uh, I'm not a person who regrets things. You know, um, even the dumbest shit I've ever done, it's, uh, it was a lesson in life. And had I not done it, I might have done it on a larger scale later on. And I... Um, and uh, I think that's why when I fight, I tend to pull the trigger because I'm not really a guy who regrets and I don't look back and I don't dwell on the past. And uh, I think one of my keys to fighting is uh, living in the moment. And right now, I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't think about my fight too much. And I think uh, that, that really helps me. I'm here right now, you know, I'm talking to you. I'm with my buddies at the track, they're all stretching. Like, uh, I don't, I don't project too much in the future and I don't, 
go to the, I don't dwell on the past. And I think, uh, yeah, so I've never really considered that. Like, uh, I, I, yeah, I haven't considered what would have happened had I stayed and not got hurt or, yeah, I didn't. But uh, I could see most people doing that. <laughs> I see. Definitely. Right. I right. think it comes from, my mom passed away when I was six. And, uh, you know, yeah, you might be tempted to think how it might be if she, if she was here, you know, and uh, I think that plays a factor in that. I don't, I don't really know, but I think that I, I never thought of it in context of her, so I don't, I don't do it in anything with that. All right, guys, get away. So much less serious of a context, mm -hmm. so I just, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't really do that, so. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't answer the question that well. Right. No, 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 you, you answered it fine. You answered it fine. Now, you made your return in March of 2012 when you fought against Jamie Hara. I'm just curious, when did you start looking for fights? Like, how many weeks, how many months, whatever it was. When was the time that you started looking for fights? When was the time that you said to yourself, okay, I'm healthy, I want to fight, Let's start looking for one. When did you sit down with your manager and say, hey, let's go find one? When did that take place? So I'd say about the eight weeks, two months, I'd say about five months out. Because I had been going in, I constantly going in and uh, helping my teammates trying to get ready for their fights. Uh, when I was on that layaway for three years, getting hurt, and that's how I kept getting hurt, kept going in. But I'd say about five months prior is... Uh, I, you know, because I always wanted one. I always told him I wanted one, but then two weeks later I'm hurt, and it's just like, well, you gotta not be hurt for a while till you get one. And uh, let's say, yeah, around five months or so mm -hmm. is when I voiced it to my manager, my coach, and uh, they said, just be around a while and then do a full camp, and then we'll get you a fight. And, and fortunately, it all worked out, mm -hmm. and uh, I got the fight. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cage Combat Fighting Championship. That was the organization that you returned to in March of 2012. Did they name that event after you? Because you know you're fighting in the main event, and this is also your return to mixed martial arts. And the name of the event was the Return. So was this event promoted around you? It was a. Uh, it was the day that Cage Combat hadn't been there for a while as well. Um, oh. And I think it had something to do with the Return also, but. Um, I no one told me that per se, but I I, I definitely sell a lot of tickets when I um, fight locally. So if, if they gear it toward me, because I've never lived anywhere else in my entire life, and I've coached practically every sport you can imagine. So I mean, I there's kids I don't even remember their names. I coached them in indoor soccer 20 years ago, and <laughs> I see them at the fight, you know. So. Um, I, it wouldn't surprise me if part of the name was for me also. Oh, I see, I see. Now, Jamie Hara, he's a very tough fighter. He's been around for a very long time. Uh, was he the first name that was thrown your way? Obviously, you just said, you know, a, a while back, um, you know, you just kind of go where they tell you to go. You don't really pick fights. You don't really care where the fights are, what shows it in. As, as long as you have a fight, you don't really care about yeah. the, uh, the behind-the-scenes stuff. But was Hara the first name that was thrown your way? Because, you know, that's a very tough fight for someone who's been out of the game three-plus years. Was that the first opponent offered to you? Yeah, um, they had a couple other guys, and uh, besides, like, uh, besides considering how tough they are and how much they like to fight is what I usually consider, like, their record has uh, something to do with it, too. And uh, one thing that I didn't know that my manager mentioned to me was if you take a three-year layoff, like, some people might think you improved a lot in three years, and they might be a little more hesitant to fight you then. Maybe if you took three months off, because how much can you improve in three months as opposed to three years? Mm. So I was told that maybe people who w would have usually took the fight, um, they wouldn't. And uh, I was told that he was my fifth opponent, and they uh, a lot of people said yes, and then ended up saying no, like uh, a couple weeks later. So it dwindled down to him, and that was the first time I fought a southpaw. And at the time, I didn't have too many teammates that were so far. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I know he took second in state at wrestling a long time ago, but I knew he had 
experience in wrestling. So I was going against probably if you consider my worst matchup, it would be a, a good wrestler with good stand up southpaw, and that's what I happen to go against. So uh, it was a mental challenge for me, as well as just the physical challenge and getting over the experience. And um, like when I first started coming up, Jara he had like three belts. Like <laughs> three different ways, and right, it was right. every organization around here. So it was like he was the kind of guy we were looking up to at first, you know, to try to uh, eventually beat me and a couple of my teammates. And uh, so um, I, you know, I, I, I like, I like the matchup because it was a challenge. I'm always looking for a challenge because honestly, if I don't consider the guy a challenge, I'm definitely not going to train as hard. And I think my um, my coach and my manager know that too. So I think they try to um, always tell them, give me the best guy they can. And I, you know, they don't tell me what they do or what they think or uh, how they do their selection process. Or So it's, it's, it's kind of hard to say, but I was told that a couple guys backed out and Jamie Jarrett's down to fight anyone anytime. Right. He's one of those guys. It's his 50th fight or something. Right. Yeah, so... Mm-hmm. I got a lot of respect for guys. <laughs> yeah, I stepped in the cage 50 times. Mm-hmm. He had more, he had more losses than I had fights. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, you know, he's older, and I, I, he did good. And uh, I learned a lot from that match. He let me push him around against the cage while he was resting. Right. And the other thing, I, you know, he he used a lot of veteran tactics and I learned off him during the fight. And, um... He showed me that you could cut a lot of weight and still, you know, he just gave up the energy expensive positions, you know, so that he could have all those extra pounds. And uh, he, he, he taught me a lot in that fight. Honestly, he really right. did. Right. I think he has more gladiator challenge belts than you have fights. He has- yeah, I know. He probably does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah. Uh, experience is big. I think so, but to an extent, because it only is when you learn from it. Like otherwise, every old Pearson would be really wise, mm-hmm. and they're not. They get fooled a lot. They get fooled and tricked out of their money, and it's because just because you have experience doesn't mean you've learned. You know, and that's one thing I um, definitely consider mm-hmm. when I'm going to experience opponent. Mm-hmm. That was a very tough fight. He didn't want any part of the ground. It was basically all stand up. He wanted to just stand up and take your head off. Uh, very close fight, split decision. You got the nod. Uh, going into the judges' scorecards before they had read the decision, how confident were you that you had done enough to get the win? Oh, I was one hundred percent. It was. Uh, I I was surprised it was split. Honestly, I mean he he landed the better shots in my. Uh, if you pick the best shot in the fight, he landed it. It was a straight left right to my face. And uh, if you look at us, I was definitely more damaged in the face. But I spread my damage all around him. Kick him in the, kick him in the head. I kneed him in the body. I was beating his body. I hit him in the face. Like I think I spread my damage around more. And uh, I was definitely the octagon aggressor. Like I had three out of the five criteria for the majority of the fight. So, as far as I was concerned, I thought I totally won it. And even if, you know, unfortunately, like, uh, in fighting, a lot of times, the win will go to the local person, not because the judges are biased, because they're human. And uh, I have a couple hundred people there. Every time I hit him, they cheer. Every time he hits me, it's not as loud. Mm-hmm. So, it's, you know, there's you have to consider that in the... Um, decision as well that people are cheering for my offense more than they were cheering for his because it was in my own town. Right. So even if it was dead even, I would imagine I would get the nod anyways just from that factor alone. Mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely. So I honestly wasn't worried and I was surprised <laughs> I was split. Mm-hmm. I see, I see. And honestly, like decisions, it's like, it's really kind of hard for me to consider it a win. It's because in the street, we'd just still be fighting. Right. And I've seen so many fights where you're like, this guy's done. It's over. And then you think, oh, man, he won. <laughs> <Right>. like, <laughs> so 
it wasn't over, so I mean, there's always that chance. Right. So it, it just, it's hard for me to consider it a victory, really. Mm-hmm. Almost like it's mm-hmm. never ended, kind of. Mm-hmm. Now, the Jamie Hara fight was your first fight back after a three-year hiatus. Uh, after that fight, the Keto Andrews fight uh, happened uh, in November, but that was November of 2013, and the Hara fight happened in 2012. So there's a year-plus layoff again that you're on, you know, another yeah. long layoff. What happened there? Yeah. Did you have injuries? Well, you know, I, what? I got hurt a little, but it was more, um, I had been dating a girl for seven years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've just been paying attention to fighting so much. I um, I took time off to work to earn some money to buy a ring, and we went to uh, Australia. I asked her to marry me, and uh, I just felt like I owed her, and I owed her some time, and uh, and I um, took it and to earn the money to you know to work to earn the money to go do that. And I just took care of a couple things in my life that I definitely, I don't know, when you just, it's hard to do, when you have a fight scheduled, it's hard to take care of, or it used to be for me prior to those last two fights. It was really hard for me to take care of uh, any other issue in my life or business because uh, the fight seemed to take priority. As I always justify it as, well, you might get your jaw broke if you don't train. <laughs> right. So, you know, I always was just fight with first, fight with first, and it was kind of the first time that I didn't put fighting first, and I put her there, so I would, I would attribute a lot of that just to, like, earning money. Because, like, I'm not, I have a $500 car, I grow most of my own food. <laughs> I used to live with like six people. They you know, like ran it. Like instead of trying to earn money and spend it more, I was always just not trying to spend money, and and I had to earn money to get a ring and a trip. So it was mostly because that. A five hundred dollar car. What are you driving? The Intrepid. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like oh. ninety nine Intrepid. Yeah, and the doors don't work, the windows don't roll down, one won't roll up. It just I'm 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 not too uh into material stuff. Mm. I'm not really that big on I have everything in the planet I want except for a piece of land. Mm. It's really just like people are like, What do you want? I'm like, Absolutely nothing. There's like <laughs> no physical object I I want. I don't really care about that stuff. But it gets you from point A to point B, so that's good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we call it A, but point A to point B. <laughs> right. <you know? laughs> right, right. Now, is this girl that you proposed to? Is this your wife now? Or are you still engaged? Uh, what's the deal there? Yeah, we got married uh, May thirty first. Oh, and okay. that's why I hurt my sternum, and then uh, I was trying to come back and get a fight before the wedding, but I I didn't want to. She didn't want me to fight, and I didn't want to fight within a month of the wedding because I looked pretty beat up after a couple of fights. Like people see you in the ring, but they don't see you two, three days later when uh, your face is just every color of the rainbow. It's swollen out. <laughs> like people, people would be surprised if they like. After my first UFC bout, I came back. And, and I had like ten people ask me if I got in a fight after my fight. Right. Like, what happened to you? I'm like, you didn't see the fight? Like, yeah, I saw it. I was like, and they're like, well, what happened to your face? I'm like, this. Like, this is what it looks like three, four days later. <laughs> like, they, I don't think right. most people realize you're not gonna look like that. You know, you look at Uriah's leg after Aldo. Right. Mm-hmm. It's just like people don't consider that and. uh and I wanted to get in, honestly, two fights after keto before I went um, to my marriage. And then I was hurt, and it, it lasted to the point where uh, I had enough time, but there has to be a venue, an opponent, and a person on those dates also. So it just didn't line up. But we got married May 31st, and I've been trying to get one since. 
Yeah. And I just waited for Tachi to have their next show, so here I am. Mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely. Now, I'm curious, Nate, what's the goal for your career? What's the plan? Obviously, earlier you said that you know you, you kind of just live in the moment. You don't really dwell in the past, and you don't really uh, you know live in the future. You, you kind of just live in the moment now, but there's got to be a plan, right? You know, what is that plan? You know, are, are, you, are you hoping to make it back to the UFC? Is, is that the, the main goal, or are you just looking to fight? Um, I honestly feel like, you know, I train with a lot of guys around the UFC and, um, and are in the UFC, and I do really good against them, and I, I just feel like I'm definitely good enough to be on a decent level in the UFC, and especially, I want to see how good I am at 170, too. I'm, I am one of the taller people on the planet. I'm 6'2". I'm not going to be 6'2", guys at 70. Like, I just, I really want to see how I do at 70. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the UFC never has me back, I want to fight in Japan. I just want to, I kind of want to, you know, go. I I was really excited about Silva because I would get to go to Brazil. And, you know, I know a lot of people don't want to go there, but I really want to fight in Brazil and Japan one day just because those are the other countries that really embrace fighting, you know, and especially Japan and and uh, their crowd, how they just, I just love watching Pride and how they were all dead silent, they would all pay super attention, all really respectful, and they, um, they didn't make fun of you for trying to grapple, or <laughs> you're a pussy right. or a wuss, right. Right. Um, they appreciated it, and uh, so I, th- I think um, my style would be appreciated a little more in Japan, but I definitely want to find the UFC, and um, I'll keep beating people up on the regional circuit till they take me back or, uh, you know, because a lot of times people get hurt in the UFC and if you just, if you're always ready, I think you might be able to just get a fight like that as well. Mm-hmm. That be, could be another to get in. But um, I, I don't see myself stopping anytime soon. Honestly, the ultimate goal for me was always just to be I'm just curious, what was your philosophy on fighting and also, um, you know, your your mindset about your career pre-2008? Like, like what, 
what motivated you to be in the sport? Is it the same thing? Is it the same motivation that you have now? Is it is it different reasons? You know, go back to two thousand eight. What before this this long layoff and this kind of rebirth of you in this sport? What what were you like? What was Nate Lagren like back then? Definitely um, uh, a lot more ignorant, <laughs> right. a little more delusional. Um, just not as you know. I, oh yeah, I knew people got their faces broken, their hands broken. Not me, you know. That can't happen to me. That's just that guy, you know. And uh, I guess that was more my mentality. And I really, um, one thing I learned that uh, I didn't think I could lose back then. I, I, it sounds fucking weird, you know. I would give people like point one chance percent of winning in my mind. Like I really, really thought I would just destroy it. And, and, you know, all the people I had fought, not anyone, you know, if I, they gave me against Anderson back then, I wouldn't have thought that. But um, I definitely felt like, uh, yeah, they really had very, very little chance of beating me. And now I think I came to the realization that um, once you realize that anyone can beat you, you have the opportunity to beat anyone. And that's more my mentality now. It's more realistic. And uh, then, yeah, that just bad stuff happens to everyone else except me, <laughs> like type thing. <laughs> right. And, uh, yeah, I was just, I guess, just uh, younger and more delusional. <laughs> right, right. It's definitely the, the main difference, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Do you consider yourself an undefeated fighter? Because obviously the crater fight, it was kind of weird. It ended with an injury, not you know a a real clean clear cut ending. It didn't end in a knockout or submission or a decision. It ended uh, in the corner. So, uh, do you consider yourself undefeated still, even though you have that blemish on your record? No. Um, so I was like slightly hurt before that fight. Like, um, like if I went into the uh, if I went to the fight with, like, a broken hand, like, and then I lost as a broken hand, I might be a little more apt to mm-hmm. maybe even consider that as an option. But when I'm in a fight and he did the damage on me in that fight, it, I can't I can't think that I did it lose. <laughs> you know? Right, right. I definitely considered it a loss. And uh, the cool thing about it now is when I go to a fight, it's like, I'm going to get a win and an awesome lesson, or I'm just going to get a life lesson, you know, just from the loss. And it's like, it really seems like a win-win situation, like whatever is going to happen now. I'm going to take it and make it a positive. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you a full-time fighter or do you work a second job? Because I know you said you grow things. Yeah, Yeah, I work. Yeah, I did. um, I just do... uh, a lot of landscaping and just anything to do with plants I can. Uh, glorified labor, whatever you want to call it. So, uh, I consult gardens sometimes. I, I just, a lot of people have problems with their plants, so I help them. And, uh, and then there's just a lot of work up here. Like, um, there's some guys, it seems like at the academy, either you have a lot where we train, you either have a lot of money or no money. And then the guys with a lot of money help the guys with no money and they give us work and like you know I got a buddy we help build his roads build his fences dug footings for his uh, concrete help you know just random random work a lot of what I do and the main thing is uh, I grow my own food so I don't really have to earn as much money as most other people and I don't have car payments yeah, I wouldn't even have this cell phone if it weren't for my manager. Like, uh, there's, I just, re- yeah, I don't really need too much money to live, so I don't have to work too much. But, um, so I'm pretty close to full time fighting. Like, I train, I train four hours a day, and then I do a lot of breathing exercises, and uh, I train my mind a lot. You know, you hear a lot that, um, oh, it's ninety percent mental. And then they train 10% mental at best and 90% physical. And that, that I'm, I train a lot more mental than most other people. And I really focus on my breathing and just a lot of things. 
I don't think too many other fighters consider to be that important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, is it situational training? Like, will you picture something happening in a fight and then try to train for that? Because, you know, there's a lot of guys who, uh, whether it's fighting or, or football or weightlifting even, who, who just stop breathing. They, they, you know, they go in there and they, you know, get in, in the, the heat of the moment and then they stop breathing. Is, is this, this breathing training, are you, like, picturing yourself in different scenarios? Well, it's, uh, where I really, uh, really was iterated to me how, how far breathing was when, I read this book, and he said, how long can you go <laughs> without eating? You go three months. And I know I'm really clean eater, a really healthy eater. There's, and I don't do it just because fighting. I do it because I want to live a long time. And I really have that stress on my brain. And he's saying, how long can you go without eating? You go about three months. And then he's like, how long can you go without drinking? Three days. And then uh, he said, how long you go without breathing? Like five minutes. He's all, it's that much more important than your eating and your drinking. And uh, when I learned that, I learned there's different technique, breathing techniques to make make your heart beat quicker and get up. And there's other ones to make you calm down. And I use a lot of those in between my rounds. And I practice them uh, in my practice. Like another thing I do is when I'm done with my because I have a five round fight, I train six rounds, and then we'll cut the minute and a half, so I'll do 30 seconds in between. And then after I'm done with the six rounds, I'll put a 15 pound medicine ball on my stomach oh, yeah. and try and get my breath back. And it is a, uh, it's an extremely <laughs> claustrophobic feeling. You feel like, like the first like 10 times I did it, I couldn't, I didn't get back to the point where I caught my breath. I just pushed the ball off my stomach after like two minutes because I felt like I was gonna faint. And, uh, I, and uh, when you're pushing up those muscles that help you breathe, because you want to push them out to expand your lungs, that's where that medicine ball comes into play. You push it out as hard as you can. You're pushing a 15-pound ball up. And then so next time when you go to just breathe normally, there's no 15-pound ball in it, and those muscles are just expanding and contracting like because you're basically lifting weights with them. And... Uh, I really, really like to focus on my breathing. I'm, I'm surprised how much it helps me. And uh, one thing that people don't consider about shape is, yeah, um, at the end of the fight, when you're fit, you make better decisions. Because when you're tired, you make horrible decisions. And uh, I think that is a major factor in in being cardiovascularly fit is, is the way better decisions you're going to make due to just being in a, better state of mind and uh i think yeah, that's yeah breathing is just huge and fighting and i don't see too many guys practicing it at all mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it seems like your training is very scientific and it's very um you know uh, well thought out um how much of a mixture of the training is it you know obviously uh breathing it's very important but you can't knock someone out with breathing you can't submit someone with breathing but you know there's there's you know a, a very a big importance to that because you know you you need that you know like you said that that big drop off from the food to the drinking to the breathing you know breathing is a very important part you know how much of your training like in in terms of percentages is like the actual physical stuff that is fight specific and then how about the the other stuff that could help you uh you know w- put it all together you know have the gas to go the distance have the stuff that you need to make your body a, a real machine how, how much would you say percentage wise is the the actual fight specific and then the actual uh getting your body right okay like um one thing that a lot of people when they break down fights they'll say oh he can win from they'll pick one of the main arts right you know, he's better kickboxer he's superior wrestler he's superior boxing or he's superior jiu-jitsu and like as far as I'm concerned, you can win with confidence. You can win with uh, audacity. You can win with uh, courage. You can win with endurance. There's all just other, so many other just personality attributes that you can just win a fight with. And you see guys like Matt Brown. You're like, like how does he beat all those people? And it's his mentality, his will, his all these other untangible factors that you can't really add up when you just see a guy 
And I think those things are far more important than people give credit for. And to me, like, I just the, the more I get into it, the, um, I would say the less I realize it is a physical thing. It's a mental, spiritual, <laughs> um, and also physical uh, contest. It's like, uh, you know, you battle... You know, the fight, as far as I'm concerned, started three weeks ago, you know? When we, you know, he's tweeting and this and that, like, the psychological warfare has begun. And it's, uh, there's so many different aspects. I would definitely say, I'll probably say about, it's probably about half and half right now. And I think by the end of my career, it'll be more like maybe 30 physical and 70, all those other intangible factors that are really hard to add up that, I'll be working on to make, um, to seemingly make your physical that much better. And that's, that's, uh, an interesting aspect of that, that the more you train your mind, like, a lot of times the more it can make you seem physically better. Because, uh, just like Matt Brown, his mental endurance, like, people always say, like, I have physical endurance, but mental endurance is extremely important, like, (laughs) <laughs> and that guy just got it in space and he just really displayed it this weekend against Robbie Baller. Like you look at him, you're like a lot of people were telling me he's gonna get knocked out in two minutes. I'm like, nah, <laughs> no, he isn't. Right. This is an animal, but it. He's just one of those guys who I don't know if he embraces that aspect of it and is training as much, but it's a uh, it's a mi- you know fighting's a microcosm of life and uh, you're gonna fight how you live. And if you live balls to the wall and you fight balls to the wall, you're going to fight balls to the wall like my opponent, Ricky Leger, you know. He doesn't, he gets busy. He's uh, 26 years old. He has 23 fights. Like, the kid, you know, he does not wait around. And I, I pretty much suspect that he lives like that, too. And then the guys who are really cautious, and I think they live really cautious, too. And uh, so I think it... Your your fighting style is definitely just yeah. Sorry to use the word again, but a microcosm of how you live, you know. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Now you're still training out of NorCal Fighting Alliance, but I'm just curious who's there for you to train with because I know that David Mitchell he recently went to Team Alpha Male. Who are some of your main sparring partners there right now? Obviously, Dave Terrell, he's your head coach, but training partner wise, yeah. who's there? He doesn't spar with us no more. We okay. just spar with him. That was the scariest thing I've ever done, <laughs> by the way. Like, ever. Like, people ask me if I'm scared and uh, if I get nervous for fights. So I'm like, no, I used to have to spar with the fucking right. Terrell. Because right. I was just a wrestler in there, and they're like, before I ever fought, they're like, you going to spar? I was like, spar with who? They're like, Dave. I'm like, no. <laughs> and they're like, you have to. There's no one else here. And I was just like, oh, shit. That was... That was definitely the scariest thing that I had to do. And, uh, hey, what's the question? I'm sorry, Mike. Oh, the question was, who are some of your training partners? Well, actually, no. Okay. Uh, you, you brought up you brought up Dave Terrell, and I'm very curious about him because, you know, he, uh, you know, kind of disappeared from the scene. Obviously, he's been coaching all this time, but, you know, his fighting stopped. You know, he, I can't remember his last fight exactly, but, you know, he was he was fighting uh, Evan Tanner or Matt Lindland. I can't remember who it was. And then all of a it's sudden... Lindland, Tanner, yeah. and then Scott Smith. And yeah, he, right. And then he disappeared. Why, why did he stop fighting? I think, um... I, you know, this is my opinion, and uh, I think it really had to do with uh, cutting weight. Mm. Like, I think he cut too much weight. He was like an Anthony Rumble Johnson type, like, uh, and he would have to do a two-month camp before his camp started to get in range of the weight. Like, the guy was like 225, and he's fighting 185, and I think that really... Uh, I think eating's one of his favorite things in life, and uh, and I and he's been a wrestler since he was a little tiny kid, and he had to eat this or not eat that his entire life, and I think he just, I think that is the main factor in him not continuing fighting, in oh. my opinion. 
Oh, I see. I see. I was always curious about that because he he was a badass fighter. He was he was at the top of the food chain in the UFC, and then he yeah. just disappeared basically overnight. He was gone. Yeah, I honestly feel like uh, he could still easily compete with the upper echelon of the UFC. You know, honestly, like it, yeah, he rolls. He's rolled every day since then. Every single day, he's like a fucking samurai. He's, he's there right now. He's rolling. They like the guy. He just he's, he's in love with jiu-jitsu and he likes fighting and he breaks it down so well and but uh, yeah I just yeah I you know I really think if you put him against the floor Ashwell and USB guys I would feel sorry for him I would, really would it would be like he's gonna hurt him bad <laughs> right I mean he's broke so many <laughs> arms shoulders ankles and knees like and I think. Uh, even a lot of people are like uh, respect our jiu-jitsu maybe even a little more than they should just because of his reputation of just destroying limbs like I've had people tap out what I thought was early because I mean they knew I would break it <laughs> you know like like in practice if you have like back in the day not anymore if you had an arm bar and the dude wasn't tapping you were supposed to break it like he's an idiot he could tap it's I mean he could tap with his mouth his foot his hand like and we had no problem popping each other's arms ankles and I've had every limb on my body pop because I was a fucking idiot and didn't tap and <laughs> now I'll tap but um, I think uh, we were a little like when we when people came to our gym and trained back they were like you guys are fucking you guys are pretty crazy you guys are nuts like we trained pretty hard it's pretty brutal training and uh but um we get to go down with uh the scrap pack in san francisco and go with uh gilbert melendez dick shields and they got a gang of dudes down there guys uh and then uh, also lodi the with uh nick and nate diaz and a lot of times they're kind of like a mobile academy like they'll all be in san francisco or they'll all be in stockton or they'll all be in concord and uh we have to go down there they're a lot closer to each other than they are to us and they'll occasionally come up but we're the we're the outpost with north in santa rosa so they have to drive like two hours to get to us and they only have to drive like an hour hour and a half to get to each other but i try to train with them when i can but it um usually get more training in with them when I don't have camps. Mm, I see. Okay. Okay. But yeah, just getting the experience with like Nick and Nate just going in there and with Gilbert and Jake. Jake's a freaking animal. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And he does not go easy in practice. <laughs> like yeah. it uh it's you're you're fine for your life when you're doing anything with him. He just goes a hundred percent. He's he's uh Quite, quite an animal and it's funny those four guys are like they, you know they they always came up looking up to Dave you know my teacher you know and they're like damn you guys roll with Dave damn you know cause he's big you know but we have this other guy Nasty Nate too he beats the shit out of everyone mm-hmm. at our academy he just does jiu jitsu doesn't fight anymore but um yeah just if you've ever rolled with either of them I've never rolled with anyone since then that made me feel that uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anywhere I've I rolled with, you know, maybe fifty black belts before, but right. I've right. never felt pressure and techniques like that ever. Right. <laughs> and it's cool that I get to feel it that often. So I don't I don't really feel like I'm in too deep of waters when I grapple with other people, which is it's, it's awesome. Right. Right. I'll pass. I'll let you grapple with those guys. I don't. I don't want to. Do that. <laughs> you get down at all? Do you train? No, no, no. I just talk. Right on. You're from Michigan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, from Michigan. Oh, right on. Yep. How long you been doing this? Um, since I was 18, so 2009, 2010, something like that. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh-huh. Yep. And. uh uh, love it. I've been doing it ever since. Trying to trying to make uh, trying to make my way, just like awesome. guys like you. So you ask a lot of good questions, like relevant, cogent, yeah. actual good Thank questions. You. Nah, Thank I don't you. really get like I, I can be a dick sometimes. Cause <laughs> <laughs> people just 
like uh, I'm not exactly asking really stupid questions. Uh, <laughs> I'll let them know that that was a stupid question. I, I don't I don't believe you can be a dick. I don't I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, yeah. Now at NorCal Fighting Alliance specifically, I know you've named a couple guys that you've trained with, but right now at the gym helping you get ready for this specific fight who's helping you we got this this kid Colin Hart he was on uh, Ultimate Fighter Yep. he's a 185 pounder so it's cool and he's extremely strong he's not a guy he doesn't have a beach body right yeah Yeah. very deceptive you don't look at that guy and and if he was in a if he was in a bar you would challenge him to a fight but you know he's a badass but you know what I mean he doesn't really look like a fighter but but he gets it done He he does he has a fight actually um, three days after mine, so it's good. We're um, we're doing the camp together, and he fought when I fought last time at Tachi, so that's good. And he's a really high level grappler. He has unlimited endurance, and he's extremely strong. So it's a good training partner. And we got this kid, uh, Jordan Williams. He's a monster. He's gonna you're gonna be interviewing and talking about him a lot pretty soon, like. Uh, He's an extremely high-level wrestler. He took fifth in the nation as a junior, and he didn't even go to nationals his senior year. He took second at State in California, which is pretty really? crazy. And the Whoa. he lost to was just ripping up the NC2A. He's just destroying everyone. And uh, he just decided to go the fire out. And uh, he's a southpaw, 170-pounder. I think he was 8-1 as an amateur, and now... He just got kind of hosed at a fight. He got cut, and it wasn't his eye or nothing, but they stopped it. He He's 2-1 now, but he should be 3-0. And, and then uh, we got this other guy, Don Waters, who he was also on the Ultimate Fighter, and uh, he's a 170-pounder. He's like, he's about 6'2", and he has 81-inch reach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's really good to get the opportunity to spar with him because I'll never, I mean, that's like the fifth longest reach in the UFC or something like behind John Jones and Stephen Struve. Like, you don't really get to spar with guys like him and he's really athletic, really strong, got great endurance, he wrestled before, he's just as good and he's developing a stand-up and uh, I get to train with him a lot also. And then we have a crew of kickboxers that are always there and only kickbox and then we have crews of jiu-jitsu guys who only compete in jiu-jitsu and then we have boxers now, there's quite a few good boxers in Santa Rosa and in the Bay Area and our boxing coach Raul sets up sparring sessions in Vallejo and Nevada and Richmond and um, and guys come in here too so we get a lot of decently high level guys in their individual sports that we get to mess with them at and then uh, and those three guys are the main guys that I train with uh in MMA to prepare for that. Oh, I see. I see. Now, besides Dave Terrell, who are the other coaches? We have uh, Raul Garza. He's our boxing coach. Mm -hmm. And he's just, uh, he's an ex-sheriff for Marin Marin County. And he's just, he's just a really good guy. Gives his time to the youth. And uh, he trains as well. He's he's a, he's a, good trainer he gets people hitting people like uh we're starting to get some tkos and uh it's coming from him once they are starting to see it and uh, you see all of our our whole academy it's hard to it's hard to see how much you progress because everyone else progresses with you you know because they're getting better your my teammates are getting better so i'm getting better so you don't necessarily like know that you're getting better at the rate you're getting but uh, I think it's starting to pay dividends uh, for Raul's training. We have two other boxing coaches, uh, Eli and Pokey, and then we have uh, Terrell, our jiu-jitsu instructor and MMA coach, and we have this other brown belt, Andy. He shows us, Andy Miranda, he shows us a lot of uh, high-level jiu-jitsu. And then uh, we have a kickboxing coach and Dave Dennison, and uh, that rounds out the coaching staff. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to get your thoughts on this. Uh, that region, 
has always been stacked full with talent. It, it always has been, and, and most likely will always be, uh, chock full of, of great fighters. Why is that? Because, you know, Tachi Palace, you look at the, the roster of guys that they've had fight for them that have come from this region, they're all awesome. They've all gone on to, to great things. You know, a majority of them, I should say, have gone on to great things. What is it about this region that makes it so good? I think um, I, uh, Tachi is like... Damn near, like, Madeira is the literal center of California, which is pretty close to Fresno, which is pretty uh, where Tachi is. And I think it's a lot of guys from Southern California go up. It's like a Northern California guy, well, Northern California guys fight up here, and then when they get good enough, it seems like they go there. And same with the SoCal guys. Like, we kind of meet the Southern California guys there, and then who's better usually bounces to the UFC, like... Mm-hmm. Last time I was talking to Richard Goodman, he said, I think, and I'm, they sent a lot more since. I know that Tachi sent 35 guys to the UFC. So it's like, it's pretty much a UFC trampoline right there. Right. And uh, I just, my friends, like, uh, my friend Jimmy, he's from New Jersey, and he, he's just saying, like, out on the West Coast, it's, he just says it's fight culture. Like, he has to explain what MMA is to people. Back right. there still, like some people don't know. Like I remember doing that, like more like 2008. I was like, I do make martial arts. Oh, what's that? Right. Like, that's cage fighting. And then they go, Oh, that crazy stuff where people beat the shit out of each other. And you're like, Yeah, that stuff. But now I, I don't even have to explain it, anything. And like we have four year old kids and six year old men and fifty year old women. Like we have every age demographic training here. It's just it's I don't it it is it is kind of weird I guess I don't I, I couldn't really answer that on the head really <laughs> like right. there's a lot of good wrestlers in California I think that always makes a great base for fighting right but I, I yeah that's a interesting question actually there is always hot spots in the US you could tell California's got some real good guys Florida's really good New York's got really good guys, and those are like the main population centers, mm-hmm. so that kind of makes right. sense. But right. then there's there's other places that aren't too populated that really hold it down too. So it's 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 kind of hard to say. I guess once you get good, um, you attract the good talent there. You know, Southern California has what half of the Brazilian fighters there. You know, all these guys are in Southern California. That's right. where they make their camps and their home and. I think their skills translate and trickle down to even the lower levels. So I think that might have something to do with it. Uh, right. Right. I think because Brazilians, some if you notice, all the Brazilians when they come to America, they're on the coast. Yeah, they want to be near the beach, you know. And I think that's why we got a lot of that Brazilian talent here initially, like in San Diego and LA. And then you look at Florida with the Black Brazilians and American Top Team and. It, it seems like a lot of their talent comes here, which makes us mm-hmm. be better because they're practicing with us, and it makes us seem maybe a little more talented. <laughs> right, right, right. It's just interesting because, you know, the Tachi Palace, dating back to the WEC, and then you had PFC and now Tachi Palace, it's, it's uh, you know, sometimes there's trends. Like, you know, for at one point in time, uh, Ring of Fire in Colorado, they were doing good things, and then for some reason they disappeared, and then there were other shows that popped up around the United States that had a lot of talent. They had a lot of good guys back, yeah. Yeah, but for whatever reason, Lamore, California is still the place to be if you want to make it to the big show. If you can do, I always say it's like uh, that Frank Sinatra song, New York. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. You can make it anywhere. Yeah, (laughs) Lamore, California, there it is. For MMA, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. That's, uh, now, that's one of the things I did embrace when I went to UFC that I knew I was coming out one of the tougher regions in the world and it you know I felt like it could carry me far I just I felt good about it that knowing that I'm not just some guy from Delaware who is 20 and 0 you know right. never right. fought anyone you know did just thought I was real good just never you know it's uh when you're the best guy at your academy, you should probably leave. Right, you know? right. 
that's like up here in, in Michigan. I mean, there's a lot of good talent here, don't get me wrong. Uh, Darren Crookshanks in the UFC, Miles Jury is in the UFC, but uh, you know, there's a lot of r- uh, local superstars here, guys who are the best guy in their gym, but then you look around in their gym and they're just a bunch of amateur guys or maybe some low-level pros who don't have many wins, and you look around there and you're like, well, you're the best guy, but you know, there's guys who are at uh, Greg Jackson's gym, who are not the best guy, and they're in the UFC picking up a bunch of wins. And you look around their training room, and there's killers everywhere. And then you look at your gym, and there's there's nobody. So it, it's very interesting that you bring that up because I I always say that I always go, you know, why don't you just go somewhere else? You got you're beating up all these guys who no one's ever heard of. Go go find somebody else. Go go get yourself better. I've heard of a couple situations where that's worked to people's disadvantage, mm-hmm. and I heard of it with. Um, What's his name? Really good Canadian fighter. He's a black guy. Great elbows. David Luizzo. David Luizzo, yeah. The Crow. I heard he went down to San Diego and rolled with Dean Lester. And Dean Lester, you know Dean Lester. He's a world champion. He's awesome. a beast. He's, Crazy. he's the biggest he 185 ever. He lost all ever. confidence in jiu-jitsu because he rolled with Dean. Yeah. And, like, you know, one thing about Dave Farrell, he's like, watch out for this because this. Watch out for this because this. Watch out for this because this. Right. Honestly, yeah, against you, I have to watch out for that. Right. And I keep that separate. But against Ricky Legere, I don't have to watch out for any of that shit. Like these super tiny, intimate, detailed things in certain positions, I'm not going to have to worry about. And I keep that separate. I'm like, I'm not going against David Terrell. I'm not mm-hmm. going against, you know. And the people ask me that when I first was in the UFC, they're like, are you nervous? Are you this? I'm like... You know, when you make the NBA, you might have to play LeBron your first game. Right. When you make the UFC, you don't fight. I don't have to go, you know, fight Johnny Hendricks my first fight. You know, I, I fought, you know, Johnny Reese, and I kept that in perspective. And uh, I think that's one thing that can happen to certain fighters when they go to those big gyms. They actually realize how shitty they are. <laughs> and right. It, it just destroys their confidence. Right. They really, really thought they were that much better. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, here, here's an interesting question. What's better? Is it to go to a gym and find out that you're you're not that good and then maybe not fight? Or is it worse if you go into a fight training with guys who are not that great and then go and lose a fight? What's worse, ha- being humbled in the gym or being lied to and carried along for a while and then losing in the cage? What's, what's more damaging to the confidence? To me, is yeah, I'll take my beatings and, the, and my embarrassments and my um, all the bad things that happen. Hopefully, they happen in, in the gym to me. But honestly, I would uh, attribute that to the person's personality type. Like for certain personalities, it would uh, <laughs> some people would prefer to think they're the big dog still mm-hmm. and just ride that confidence, and then other guys actually want to know where they are. You know, and I guess that's one of the main differences between 2008 me and now. In 2008, me wanted to win at any cost, anything. Now it's, I want to see if I'm better. And if I'm better, I will win. You know, and it's, I'll accept that now. It wasn't, I didn't care who was better back in the day. I care who won, you know. And now I feel that the better guy's going to win. And if I'm not as good, I shouldn't win. Period. I didn't train as hard or as smart as good or, with as good of people or for if I lost for whatever reason I deserve to so it's like I just want to see how good I am now before I just wanted everyone to think I was good I guess now I just actually want to see where I'm at I just want to I just want to see the truth you know and that's I guess one of my goals in MMA, see how high I am, how high I can get up there and where I really am. Now, obviously you've been fighting in in that region for a long time. I think you only have one fight outside. I think the only fight was the Crater fight that you left the state of California. Um, How important is that for you to start traveling? Obviously you touched on a little bit earlier that you were really looking forward to that fight in Brazil and you would love to get an opportunity to fight in Japan, but how much of a motivating factor uh, is that in your career location of fights? Is, Is it a big deal to travel for you? It is. I really... Um, it seems so much more important when you travel. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, you get bothered that much less about tickets and everything. You're in a hotel room three or four days before your fight. I don't even have my phone on me. I don't talk to anyone. 
I'm just focusing. And uh, when you're at home, you got you know, if you saw me plants, I have to water every day. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. <laughs> you just have a lot more responsibilities, and uh, it just makes it a lot easier when you, uh, you're not away from home. Just a lot less pressure, a lot less just being being bothered, quite honestly. And, uh, yeah, I fought at one in Vegas, but that's yeah, damn near Cali. <laughs> it's right, hard right. to say it isn't. And, uh, but, yeah, one of the main motivating factors in me fighting is to try and get out there and travel. It feels so much more important, especially when you're on a plane, to me. I don't know why. <laughs> right. first time I fought in Vegas was the first time I competed and I needed a plane flight to get there. Mm -hmm. So I just, I, yeah. I know it wasn't any more important, but it felt more. <laughs> right, right. But, but yeah, definitely, I, I, I definitely, I'm going to see the world whether it's through fighting or not, and uh, I would just like to experience it through fighting. You, you know, I, you know, you talk with, you know, Nick and Jake and Dave Terrell, like they all fought in Japan. They all loved it. They always tell the the craziest, funniest stories about being there, and it just sounds really fun to fight there. I always wanted to fight in Japan. Code and just they're all out. I just I, I don't know. I like how Japan does what they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, training wise, you've been at NorCal Fighting Alliance forever, basically. I, I think you've been there, right? Since day one, you started training with Dave Terrell. Yeah, um, yeah. He wouldn't let us fight for the longest time. I trained three years before I even got mm -hmm. a fight. Right. And, right. Uh, that, um, I went first fight. I was twenty five. <laughs> I fought five fights in ten months, and then yeah, I haven't fought too much since. But uh, right. we didn't plan on plan on getting back in there. And uh, I do realize how much easier it is just to keep fighting than to take time off, start over again. It's like you start all over again. Like I don't quite because I'm not kind of guy who blooms up in between fights. I think it's fat, and honestly, I eat the same thing when I'm done with my fight than I do during training camp. It's not, it's a lifestyle. It's not, um, it's not just a temporary thing like mm -hmm. most of these fighters. Like yeah. I saw Robbie Lawler's post. Oh yeah, um, yeah. That was, that was, that was <laughs> on the way to earning a shot. He yeah. the UFC title. He yeah. might be earning that as well. I was just like, whoa. Like, I'm nothing like that. Yeah. Oh, uh, I just, I don't uh, like I said, I try to use it as a tool to make me a better person. And one of the things that it has is a diet. You um, you think more positive, you act more positive, and you're just a better person when you eat better. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. I just, people usually want to eat, right? So they look physically different. And that's, that's the least, the least you're going to gain from eating healthy. There's so many more other fringe benefits that people do not consider until, and I didn't consider until I actually did it. But uh, it's cool. I eat all organic, I eat a lot of veggies, I eat meat, like, I lay off the meat, mm -hmm. like, a lot. Mm -hmm. Have you gone vegan or, or vegetarian in the past? I mean, obviously, Jake Shields, he's he's big into that and some of the other guys uh that you know have, have followed his lead and have adopted that lifestyle have you, ever, have you ever tried that have you ever thought about trying it anything like that to me um i just look at our teeth to see what we should eat and we have two canine teeth canine right. teeth are meant for tearing flesh right so as far as i'm concerned we should eat a little meat mm. and if we had all molars like a cow then i would only eat vegetables you know, and if we had all canines like a dog, then I would eat all meat, you know. So I, I kind of think the teeth is an indicator to what we should eat. And I kind of think of it as, like, if we were living in some village, we'd be eating roots and nuts and seeds, and then once a week someone would bag a deer or a rabbit or, you know, and then we'd eat meat. So I, I eat it about every, you know, four to six days or so. Mm -hmm. Now, Nate, I'm curious, uh, you know, obviously you have a great group of guys around you training, you've named off a, a lot of high-level guys, but have you ever had a moment where you thought to yourself, you know what, let me travel a little bit, let me go see what they got going down at American Top Team, let me go see what 
Greg Jackson's gym is all about. Let me go to Montreal and see what TriStar is doing. Have you ever had that moment where you're like, let me just let me just change up the training here? If you knew uh, David Terrell's mentality, you know that wouldn't be an option. Mm. Like, that's not even an option. Like, uh, if if I could go anywhere and train, I would go to AMC Train Creation. I would go with Matt Hume. Mm. I think okay. he's the wizard. I think he's a fucking genius. And I think that if talent poured into his camp, like it did to Greg Jackson's camp, I think he would have half the belt in Seattle. Like, I really mm-hmm. think Matt Hume, because he's been there, he's done it. I used to watch him fight, you know? Yeah. In Pancration, he's like, like he's been there, he's felt it, he's done it, and he's an excellent teacher. So if I ever had a temptation to go anywhere or... Maybe one day I'll ask Dave if I can. Um, I would definitely want to visit up there. I think they got it going on. I really like how they do their thing. And uh, like Demetrius and all. I mean, those guys are bad. I really respect those guys up there. And I don't see talent sweating in there. I see them making their guys, you know, from the bottom all the way up. You know, and I, I really appreciate that. Because I don't know if you notice, like... When everyone goes to one place, it never seems to last. Like, I don't think Greg Jackson is going to last. I bet one will break up, one mm-hmm. goes to go one way, this will happen. Like, just like Couture's. Right. Everyone was at Couture's. Everyone was, you know, and it was a hot place. But now, what, half of them are at AK, half of them are there, half of them are, you know. It's just, I don't, they're so hot, they're only going to last so long. And I don't see that with Matt Hume. I just see him building a bigger, better camp constantly. And, uh, and a big thing with uh, Dave Terrell and the Diaz brothers is loyalty, you know? And it's like, <laughs> it's, it's just so big around mm-hmm. here. And it's, it's a really big deal to my teacher. And he's passed that to me. Like, no, nah, this is our crew, this is our family. It's, it's a family thing, you know? Like, we really love each other. And, Watch out for each other, and you know, it's been, you know, birth, death, just anything that can happen in his life has happened, you know, with the academy, and it's just, uh, yeah, I couldn't even fathom permanently going anywhere, but it would, if I had to, if I got a chance to visit anywhere, it would definitely be there. I see, I see. A couple more questions before I let you go, Nate, and I really appreciate you being so liberal with your time, but just a couple more here. Um, your nickname. I noticed I looked around all the databases, and, and you don't have one. Why not? I, um, I thought of a couple cool ones. Let's hear them. And I like, huh? Let's hear them. Um, I kind of like the landlord. Like, uh, just because you're, like, trying to hold down that land, and it rhymes with locker a little. Okay. And, like, my boy, he was fucking around one time, and he was like, hey, boom, shock a locker. And, dude, like, <laughs> I heard some funny ones, like, but, um, yeah, I just, uh, I can't even think of the other ones off the top of my head, but, um, I would, if I had a nickname, it would have to be original. Like, no person in any other sport or any other, you know, like, it couldn't be a boxer from the 60s name. Right. You know, right. it couldn't be a, a, it would have to be original, 100%. And, like, uh, you know, I thought it was some cool ones. I like this one, the Alpine Samurai. I kind of like that. Like, you you know, you hear these crazy ones, like, I think Chris Levens is the craziest, the crippler. Yeah. So you yeah. really want to cripple someone? Yeah. Because, <laughs> like, and ironically, my teacher's is one of the meanest ones ever. The soul the assassin. soul assassin, like, yeah. yeah. His body's not enough, you got to kill his soul. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think, uh, I take him kind of literally to a certain extent, like, and I think you take on that to a certain extent, and, uh, that's why, um, like, Rampage, Rampage is, like, and you, right. I just, um, so if I did one, it would definitely be a positive, like, um, uh, I don't know, I, usually I could just rifle off a couple, short on words right now, I don't know, right. but, uh, yeah, it's fine, 
I've, I've toyed with nicknames or not, but I just, I just went with Locker. Mm-hmm. You know, when people call me Locker instead of Nate, it means a lot more to me because it's not, it's not just my name. It's my grandpa's, my sisters, and my dad's, and my kids to come. Like, it's more than just me. So it's like I'm representing more than just me. Mm-hmm. So I kind of like that. You know, some people are named by their nicknames and they don't even say their name. Right. And my name is so important to me. So I think that's uh, a consideration in that. Yeah. And out of all those guys, like. <laughs> And then, like, Jake don't have one, Nick and Nate don't have one. The guys I look up to, that's right. the majority of them don't have them. Right. El Nino, or Gilbert's got one. But um, he's the only one out of them, him and Dave, out of those five. And those are all the guys I really look up to. Right, as right. As fighting. Mm-hmm. We'll have to so think I think of that one. might have had an influence on that, too. Right, right. We'll have to think of one. We, we know it's not going to be the Beast or Pitbull, because there's, like, a thousand of those. So yeah, it's not gonna be one. Pitbull of is so funny. Yeah. It's just like, are you serious? <laughs> yeah, the Pitbull brothers. Yeah, they don't even they don't even use their last name. They're just Patricio and Patricky Pitbull. They don't even use their last name anymore. Funny. Yeah, yeah. they're they're excellent fighters. I oh, like yeah. watching them fight. Yeah. They're good. They're good. I like them. I like them. Yeah, the, the Pitbull and and the Beast. Like Dan Severn's the Beast and Bob Sapp's the Beast and it, the Beast. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. just like. I don't, you know, I really, if you want a mean one, I always like Bernard Hopkins, the executioner. Yeah. And I always really like Joey Beltran, the Mexican. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was, you know, there's some really clever ones. And uh, if I if I picked one, it would probably be a pretty funny little clever one. But, and I've had a co like this, not thinking one at the time, but, uh, yeah, I've, I've considered it. <laughs> yeah. A couple buddies definitely wanted me to be. The landlord was because this, there's this, uh, my buddies, they, have, they dive for abalone. Right. And they dive in many counties north of me. They dive with this certain rock where there's this 25 foot female great white shark comes back every year. And, uh,. you want to get a 10 inch ab which is a monster fucking ab <laughs> you go out there because most people are scared to go out there because the landlord's out there <laughs> so like they were like dude you should be the landlord it's just funny it's funny right right i like it i like it maybe maybe it'll catch on we'll have to see what the people <laughs> want we'll have to see we'll have to see uh, now I'm just curious. I was looking at your record, and there's a couple of fights that they claim are amateur, but if you look at the date, they take place after okay. your pro debut. So, what exactly is your official MMA record? Because I've seen a couple different ones, but I don't know what to go with. It's 11 one. Okay. Okay. Yeah, all those amateur. I don't even know where they come from. Like someone made a fake Facebook for me. I just like I'm not a really big social media guy, and like. I had like three Facebooks I didn't, before I even had one. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, just, it was kind of weird. I don't, I don't even know how to operate. <laughs> Honestly. Oh, I see. Because I was taking a look around Facebook and I saw some profiles of yours, but there's only like six friends, and it hasn't been updated since like 2012. So I'm like, yeah, that was. Yeah, what's going on? And so I go to bed at like six in the morning, and they're like, oh, I'm up and running six in the morning. Yeah. And everyone <laughs> just started laughing at that. Like, dude, we know Locker is not running at six in the morning. Right. He's a still, yeah. I, I go to bed at like six in the morning, and I wake up at like a noon. So it was just, <laughs> everyone was kind of laughing at that. Oh, I see, I see. Well, I was just curious about that. So, uh, anyways, Nate, real quick before I let you go, do you have any sponsors you'd like to thank, and is there anything you'd like to say to the fans? Um, I honestly, my sponsors tend to be just right up before the fight. Mm. Uh, permanent one through. But just, uh, if I could thank my friends, family, teammates for all the support I constantly get. That would be awesome. Nate. Manager. Oh, yeah, definitely. Tom Call. Thank you for, yeah. for the awesome interview. Yep, absolutely. Thank, thanks for doing it. Uh, really appreciate it. You got this great opportunity. Uh, title defense, finally. Yeah. The title to defend it. I felt bad because I always ditched the belts, you know? It's yeah. cool I get to defend it. Yeah, yeah.
Well, Nate, uh, really appreciate you taking the time to talk, and best of luck coming up on August 7th against Ricky Legier Jr. Thanks a lot, Mike. I appreciate it, and I hope to get some more interviews from you in the future.